Sometimes our greatest memories aren't the ones we remember the most fondly. Sometimes the memories we hold on to the longest aren't even ones that made us happy. Sometimes they keep us up late at night, pondering our every mistake, failure. What if I did something different? Was this actually my fault the whole time? Things like that can keep you up at night, and there really isn't a reason any of it should. We have no power over things that have already come and passed. It's better to focus on the things we can control. One of those memories that I've held onto a long time is something that I can actually do something about. When I was but an amoeba, I played a game that would permanently change my tastes and shape my nightmares to come. Maybe I asked a relative for video games for a holiday, and they got me Wario Land thinking it was Mario. It might have been just before one of my family's regular moves. I moved around a lot as an amoeba because we never had much money, so we'd often be forced to move somewhere else. Where I currently live now, is the longest that I've ever been in one place, and that's only been five years. The road trip seems the most likely, as my very first really strong memory came from sitting in the car. I put in the game pack. I plug in my headphones and turned on the game. This was before I played WarioWare games, and I never really knew anything about Wario at all. I was mostly wowed that this character I had never heard of had his own game, let alone four of them for this. The opening comes on, and the atmosphere was dark, moody, spooky. I was kind of scared, but as soon as the car started up and that funky beat started playing, I knew this was going to be something different from anything else I have ever played before. I played the tutorial, and I was wowed. I was never a huge fan of platformers. Mario always seemed like such an old and basic platformer. I never got why people liked it as much as they did, but Wario was different. I could go back and forth between screens. The game wasn't just about jumping. I could charge, I could go fast, and the game had such a different vibe than what I was used to. I was only 10, so my experience with games was limited, but I definitely still haven't played a game like this. Nintendo had always been the developer of bright and sunny and fun games, but this one was funky, ominous, and fun. Until a year or two later, Nintendo had never developed and published a rated M game, and I didn't have a home console at this point. So I wasn't expecting games to even be a dark or scary experience. So I finished the tutorial, walk into the boss room, and up until this point, this game had an eerie vibe, but it never really scared me so much as it just made me a little uncomfortable. Then I walked into the boss room. Aw, oh, look at this cute little idiot. What, you want me to beat that up? <laughs> Don't be so mean. And then after a few hits, Jesus Space Christ, what in the f*** is that? Nope. This game continued to be present in my nightmares for a few days after. I closed my eyes to go to sleep, and just behind my eyelids was the horrors I thought I had just escaped. Looking back on this experience as an adult, it's easy to see I was overreacting, especially since I remember playing all the way to the plant boss, and that's where I actually quit. Of course I was overreacting, after all this was just pixels. Well, I haven't played this game since, and I don't ever remember beating it. So, it's Halloween season, and what is Halloween for if not for encountering ghosts, ghoulies, the things you fear, and laughing at their stupid plastic faces? This is the perfect season to encounter my fears, conquer them, and mock my adolescent larval stage for being such a big grubby baby. <laughs> the beginning. Wario Land 4's setup is like most platformers, it's pretty straightforward. Wario hops in his car, and nearly runs over a black cat. As he zips past a newspaper hits the precious little baby. On it, the paper says, Pyramid discovered! Legendary treasures nearly found, but accidents hindered findings. Wario being the greedy guy he is, decided to chase down this treasure. Who cares if some chumps went missing? More gold for Wario. As Wario gets to the pyramid, he discovers the black cat he almost hit. How did it get here faster than him? I guess he didn't notice it. The cat hops into the pit, and just like Alice, Wario chases his white, <laughs> white rabbit into Wonderland. The temple spits him out at the entrance, where we begin our tutorial. How to play Wario Land 4 It might seem silly to include a tutorial section, but Wario Land 4 is a very unique kind of platformer, and I want to take the time to highlight just how different it is. That's what this whole video is, really. Unlike most platformers, Wario Land isn't about running to the right and reaching the end. Our main goal is to collect four pieces of a gem. Collecting these gems can be pretty easy, but in many stages, these gems take platforming puzzles to find, making you think in ways that you might not normally. But most importantly, you'll need the key, and you'll need to make it to the frog. You'll have to know and understand how Wario's full toolkit works, as well as understand what the enemies can do to you to collect these things and finish a stage. For now, let's focus on Wario's abilities. 
The tutorial for these stages are given to us in the form of hieroglyphics or images on the walls, and they never use text to explain a concept. But the GBA only has four buttons outside of the D-pad, select and start. So you can figure out everything from just playing around with the buttons. We have A to jump, so you might think we just jump on enemies to defeat them. Nah, it's not that simple. It just temporarily flips them over, gives them a few seconds, and they'll stand back up. The real way to defeat most enemies is to charge into them with the B button, or you can run into knockdown enemies to pick them up. Then you can throw them with B and choose which way you want to throw them with the D-pad. Wario's abilities aren't just for attacking either. During the charge attack, you can jump. He also has a supercharge attack with the L and R buttons. It takes a while before it builds up speed, but once it does, you'll soon be zooming. You'll need this ability to get past certain stone blocks that can't be broken with a normal charge. This is part of where the stage design gets really cool. They fully expect you to use the charge from multiple screens away from the obstacle. The game's tutorial does a great job of showing you this by setting you up with the perfect screen to play with your supercharge. That's not the only way you'll be speeding through this game. If you're on an incline, you can press down and roll into a ball. The last ability this tutorial teaches us about Wario is his ground pound. It's a pretty simple ground pound. You use it to break blocks beneath you, but they can be used from really high up to gain momentum and break the gray blocks. You can see already that there's a lot of potential in these mechanics, and I'm telling you right now that this game takes advantage of all of them. Once we found the key, we can now take it to the frog for the second phase of the stage. When you hop on the frog's head, a timer appears, the game shouts, hurry up, and high tension music plays. We have to quickly escape by getting back to the portal at the start of the stage. But once you interact with the frog, some stage elements may be blocked off or opened up, forcing you to retackle the stage from a new angle. This dynamic of taking your time to explore versus the pulse-pounding, nail-biting second phase is what makes the stage is so much fun. Once the stage is finished, you're given your money that you can spend based on your score. We'll get to what money does next. Wario is spat back out, and the next door opens if we collected all of the gems and the next stage is available. In the tutorial zone, that gives us two more options. The minigame shop and the first boss fight, Spoiled Rotten. So let's talk about my favorite part of the game. The minigame shop. I'm, I'm just kidding, I get very tired of this qu very quickly. It's kind of annoying, actually. Here you'll play some minigames and spend your freshly earned dosh to play them. The game will pay you back in froggy coins, depending on how well you do. Then you can spend them on the shop just before the boss. The minigames are Wario's Home Run Derby, Wario Hop, and Wario's Roulette. In Home Run Derby, we try to hit the ball as it passes the plate. Let's just say I struggle a little bit with this one. I've never been very good at it. Wario Hop is my favorite game and best game, and is the one I most often spend my hard stolen cash on. It's basically the minigame you play when you're on Chrome and your internet is out. But now with sexy cacti. Oh baby, humana humana humana. <coughs> anyway, Wario's Roulette is a memorization game. You need to memorize which face pieces Wario has, then pick them out from the three that they present you. This can be easy to earn coins if you don't mind the occasional yassified Wario or how painfully long it takes to go through it. Enough fun though. It's time to get serious and have more fun. It's time for the tutorial boss, Spoiled Rotten, after we go to the shop. In the shop we have a small collection of items that will help us in the boss fight. What do they do? I don't know. They don't sell us, so we just have to buy them and find out what they do. The free one is just a smiley to make us feel better for being a filthy poor, so we take the free smile and grab the cannon. By the way, you don't have to buy these. You can go straight into the boss fight if you want an extra hard challenge. You can also save your money by replaying stages to get more coins and money to get bigger items. These aren't the most useful right now, but Warrior Land 4 has three difficulties, so if you're on hard or super hard, these might be really good for you. Ouch! Oh, she did not like the- oh, okay. Apparently it barely did any damage. Looks like we'll have to beat them the old-fashioned way. After a few hits, my nightmare is facing me once again. It's an easy fight, though. We can't attack them from the front anymore because of their giant sharp teeth, so we have to jump over their head and attack them from behind. The funny thing about this stage is its design. The game is telling you that this boss fight is incredibly straightforward by giving you an empty room. Also, if you look in the background, Rotten has a GameCube and lots of food. It's as if the game is calling us spoiled rotten for having a GameCube. Once defeated, we go back to the main hall where a large gold pyramid starts to rise from its center. It looks like if we want all that gold, we're gonna have to finish more stages. The rest of the map opens up for us now, and we can choose to take on the rest of the stages in whatever order we want. That's pretty much it for how you play. Other than once we get into these stages, we'll encounter enemies who are able to force Wario to change forms in order to reach new areas. Like if Wario is stung by bees, his head and cheeks will inflate, big and round, and he'll start to float towards the ceiling. You can end this by Wario hitting his head on the roof. 
This is what I meant earlier by you'll have to master not just your abilities, but the abilities enemies give you too. Now, we have to choose a stage order to beat the game in. Emerald Passage. This is where my deepest and darkest nightmares lie. Cractus a giant piranha plant-like monster who's just a total piece of garbage. His boss fight, like all of the boss fights in this game, are a delightful and horrible mixture of being incredibly creative and fun, but also annoying, stressful, timed, and requires some precise timing. But before I can get to being about that, we have to get four gems to open Cractus' door. But we also have to open four doors to even to be able to try and open his door. So we have some stages to play. Every passage in Wario Land 4 is made up of four chambers, a minigame parlor, and the boss room, and shop. All of these stages can be completed in about 10 minutes. The first one in Emerald Passage is Palm Tree Paradise, and this one has a tropical setting and theme. This one isn't even really worth talking about, it's sort of an extension of the tutorial, which is good because you can tackle any of the passages in any order, so this one being this simple tells you that it's intended to be first. If we define a tutorial stage as one you learn about the game's mechanics from, then this game is 100% tutorial. We're introduced to puzzle rooms, which are where our critical thinking is put to the test by throwing around the elderly, just like real life. These can be really fun, but also challenging, and are completely optional. In this first stage, we also easily discovered the first musical track. We can listen to these in the sound test room, but also learn about monster mechanics and Wario forms. Some enemies hit us, and rather than taking damage, we shapeshift into a new Wario form that expands our options in some way. In this one, we learn about obesity, which I'm very familiar with. Been familiar with it for a few years now. We eat a single apple and gain enough weight that we can sink in water and destroy gray blocks. Now, that's what I call tons of fun. The messed up part is, to lose weight, you have to walk it off, which just feels like they're taking a shot at me. These Wario farms are a major mechanic, and will make up about half of the main gameplay, so if you don't like the mechanics here, then Wario Land probably isn't a good fit for you. The entirety of a passage usually has some theme across them, with each stage changing within that same set theme. You can think of Emerald Pass passage is nature themed. The remaining stages are about a field of flowers, a mystical lake, and a jungle in the middle of a monsoon. Each of these can be scary in their own way. In Wildflower Fields, I experienced my first taste of body horror. Getting through this stage involves getting stung by bees repeatedly. My mom is allergic to bees, so I thought of bee stings being exceptionally scary because they could actually kill people. But what happens to Wario is especially terrifying. He swells up like a balloon and he looks so gross and he just floats off. This was the subject of one of my bad dreams caused by this game. I was terrified I'd float away. In Mystic Lake, we get a bit of that sweet thalassophobia. When swimming past certain holes in the wall, we have large horrible fish things with a sweet tooth trying to climb out of the walls to get a bite of Wario's bakery. Monsoon Jungle isn't scary unless you're afraid of thunderstorms and the fury of nature. The devs who made this must have been setting out to make a horror game or something and got left with Wario instead because there are just so many aspects of this game that are exceptionally creepy, scary, or gross. Since I've demolished these stages and made these fears my we can prune this overgrown fern. Something weird though, as we enter the chamber, the black cat runs into the item shop where the weird Game & Watch looking guy is. Yes, but we don't see them leave. Do you think... Nah, there's no way the cat could be the Game & Watch guy. While we're at the shop though, we might as well check out all the extended offerings. We have all these shadow items to choose from, uh, including black dog, large lips, large fist, and Black Dragon. They all cost 10 medals, but what they don't tell you is these bottom four are made to do extra damage to specific bosses. I didn't find this out until halfway through. If we use Black Dragon on Cractus, he'll be lowered down to just two health, meaning we barely have to deal with him at all. But I didn't figure this out until much later, so I did it the hard way. I forgot to mention it before, but Cractus is already a really creepy monster. Venus flytraps can be pretty scary and cool. They're just so alien looking, and I'm not used to plants moving. Like at all, but it can always get worse, and Cractus's second form is nightmare fuel to me. I have really frequent and bad sleep paralysis as an adult, and now I'm worried that the hat man is going to be replaced with the ass Cractus. See? Look how freaking f he is. Alright, maybe it's not that bad. I think Amoeba Me was probably just a crybaby, but I blocked a lot of this game out. I don't know for sure what it was that scarred me. Maybe it's further into this game, and I blocked it out and blamed it on Cractus. The strat for beating Cractus in this boss fight is kind of annoying. You can only hit them when they skirt along the bottom of the screen, then climb a rope ladder and ground pound them. After that, they'll drop the spittle that turns me into a zombie. If I don't turn into a zombie, they will continually follow me around taking shots at me until I take a hit. So for this, you bonk them on the head, turn into a zombie, cleanse as soon as they leave, then repeat. Every boss is very annoying in their own way, 
but Cractus is probably the least bad. My only issue is that none of what we learned in the stages before this are used in the fight against him. We don't use fatness, we don't inflate big and round, it feels weird that aside from themes, the stages have no correlation to their bosses. Anyway, we're done with Cractus. Let's take a look at the sound test. Now, you might think that the discs I've been collecting are the soundtrack. God, I wish. Instead, we get really creepy, cryptic audio and pictures that are animated and bob to the music, in air quotes. The music is all very terrifying, spooky. There's clanging metal and stuff like that. It sounds like a horror soundtrack and just all sorts of unsettling noise. I think the team really wanted to make a horror game, but got asked to do Wario instead. Topaz Passage Instead of going clockwise or counterclockwise like most people do, I'm choosing the ones in the order that sounds the most appealing to me. The Ruby Passage and Sapphire Passage are factory and spooky themed. Factory stages are hard in a lot of games, so I'm skipping that and I definitely don't want to see what this game is like when the devs are intentionally being scary. I went with Topaz Passage because of the toy theme, but that's a trick, a ruse, I've been made a fool, because the passage's real theme is being annoying. Like, it doesn't even start that annoying, but it gets there so quick. The first stage is actually really cool. The first stage revolves around everyone's favorite kind of math, geometry. Triangles work as keys, circles as platforms that we can move, and squares are affected by gravity. There isn't much that's scary in the toy stages, but at least the gimmicks are neat. And I really do like this block mechanic. These blocks feel much more leisurely and puzzle-like as opposed to the creative use of monsters and forms in the Emerald Passage. I love both, but if you do either one of these for too long, you can tire of them pretty quickly. It's like each passage is a break from the last. I liked this game before, but playing it again as an adult who can understand the intelligent design of it makes me appreciate Warrior Land 4 all that much more. Amoeba Me was a chump and 100% missed out. I just really love that it's not only a platformer, but a puzzle game too, and these two concepts work very well together in this game. Stage 2 has an interesting mechanic for us, and it's the best kind of toy. GAMBLING! This is also where the game decides it's time to be an absolute bastard. At first, it seems fine, simple, cute even, but this is a trick. You hit the rollers in the stage and you move along the board at the bottom of the screen. Whatever you land on happens. This can make blocks appear and disappear, trigger Wario forms, hearts, take damage, and more. Don't worry, it's not all fun in games. We get this nightmare fuel background. <laughs> what were these guys even smoking? Because I definitely don't want it. After being scarred, you get back to the gambling. And because this is random, we can not only miss out on things and have to repeat the stage, but it's entirely possible to die and lose the stage entirely. That's because at the end, you have to keep using the final roller to get to the final space on the board. If you roll higher than you need, it goes backwards. This is agony. I'm sure the speedrunners absolutely adore this stage. Stage 3 is probably the biggest offender in the annoyance department. Seriously, every aspect of this stage is the most annoying and frustrating shit ever. They're like, hey, guess what? We decided to have a collective aneurysm and all forget how to make fun stages. Listen, do you remember Super Mario Bros. 3 and you'd be in the desert and that angry sun guy starts chasing you down? Yeah, that was annoying and it sucked then, but we're doing it again and now it's a flying pig that also spawns enemies. As you're traversing stages, he always stays just a little bit ahead of you, but only just ahead of you enough that he will be constantly spawning things that you can accidentally and easily bump into. Then the stage is designed with spikes to avoid while he randomly drops junk wherever he feels like. He's not even the most annoying aspect of this stage, and he's already very annoying. There's a puzzle on this stage where you have to hit the pal block things to remove obstacles, and it requires pretty good timing. The problem is that half of the buttons have to be pressed immediately after a screen change. When you screen change, you don't have control for a second, and that leads to way more misses than hits. I'm very happy it's optional, but holy sh is that annoying. The next annoying thing is this disappearing path puzzle. When you stand on the platform on the left, the blocks disappear, revealing where you go. They include these little patterns in the blocks to help, until they stop doing that, and they work as red herrings now. Now I feel foolish for failing, and for trusting the devs. The worst part is, some of them go a little outside of where the screen shows, requiring you to do leaps of faith. Once we hit the frog, we get more annoyances. If you played Castlevania, you're probably familiar with fake portraits. You get close and they fly around the map and attack you. They're doing that here too, but it's the pig drawings. They come to life now, and to add to it, I'm colorblind and I can't see the platforms here, what the f Even in the other environments, all of this shaking makes it so hard to see with the diagonal lines in the background, it's creating an optical illusion effect and I just cannot judge the depth. 
In the finale of Topaz Passage is Domino Row, and if you didn't get enough of the timing mechanics, you'll get another dose of it here. Once you run past the activator, these dominoes will fall in order until they reach the flagpole at the end. If you beat the dominoes to the pole, you get rewarded with certain blocks breaking, giving access to new areas. And if you fail, you get... This can result in you losing access to important items, or it might make you take a more dangerous and hazardous path than you would typically like. They don't reset when you change areas and come back, meaning you'll have to repeat the stage if you mess up. Up until this point, the game has been very forgiving, allowing me to practice as much as I want until I hit the frog. I feel like the frog was timer enough, and while this use of parallax scrolling is actually pretty interesting and really cool, I don't like how it's used here. This ended up being where my first death in the game was, and the domino races definitely affect whether I get necessary items. There are two gem pieces that are locked behind beating the dominoes, but the portion with the frog is pretty long, leaving me with just a minute before I get the last two pieces. But when you die, you lose everything and have to start over. So let's not do that. It took me two more tries, one to finish and one to get that last piece. I really love that each stage has something new, but it's very surprising that they were able to put this together in a year. I can also see why we don't get more of these Wario Land games. I feel like they used up all their best ideas with this one, but I feel like it's been long enough that they could make another game repackaging these same mechanics and people would be pretty happy. Especially since this one was so well received, it feels weird to not have a sequel immediately after. But if you haven't been paying attention thus far, you might think, why do you want a Wario game so bad? Isn't WarioWare enough? I mean, Mario isn't only in Mario Party, is he? Also, platforming with Wario is very different than platforming with Mario. Mario is fast, agile, he jump high. But Wario is powerful, much more powerful. His ability set requires me to think and in ways you typically might not in a game. The Wario Land experience isn't a lateral one like Mario. The best way I can describe Wario Land is he's somewhere between Mario and Castlevania games. You have the speed and short stages of Mario, but the thought and puzzling of Castlevania with your environments and enemies although it is significantly less deep than Castlevania. To continue with the theme of annoyance, we have Aerodent. Damn, this game sure does love inflation. Also, did you catch the pun? Aerodent? Aerodent? Anyway, he's pretty high up, but we can beat him pretty easily because he just so happens to give us all the tools to beat him. That's, that's so convenient. That's so nice. He throws down these parachuting needles, we bounce on them, then we throw them at his belly. Great. We went from inflation to popping. When defeated, his teddy's feet will glow, we ram them, and he'll spin around being left vulnerable for a charging hit. The most annoying part of this boss is the combination of his physics, small hitbox, and torches. See, if you hit him and it's not a weak spot, he might bounce around or get knocked up higher. If he reaches the top of the screen, you have to redo the needle thing. This is made worse by just how easy it is to miss the mouse. Lastly, you have a time limit, like with all bosses, and he throws torches which lock you into a 10 second long animation, giving him time to inflate again. I did fail the first time, but that means you'll get to see what one of the items does. I don't know if any of these are more effective than the others, but I chose Black Dog because they have teeth, and they're a balloon, and teeth pop balloon, I guess. I named the dog Cupcake. Don't worry, Mousy, he doesn't bite. Get your fucking dog, bitch! It don't bite. Yes, it do! Get the all right, Topaz done. I hated all of that. Glad to be done with it. To think that you can tackle these in any order, so some kid who likes the color yellow or the toy theme sees it and thinks, ooh, this one looks fun, and instead, they get treated to the Ultra Deluxe Special at the BDSM parlor. Ruby Passage this passage isn't really scary, but I did have nightmares of factories when I was a kid. I'd be laying down on a giant metal slab, completely unable to move, and another octagonal one would be careening towards me from above and smash me just before I wake up. I'm realizing just now that it was probably my first experience with sleep paralysis, which as an adult I have nearly weekly now. I highly don't recommend it. Super scary nightmares. I could make an hour long video telling you about the nutty stuff that happens in those dreams, but this set of stages is kind of a mishmash of themes. I guess they couldn't take the machine theme as far as they would have liked. The first stage is about conveyor belts, rotating gears, and introduces Pancake Wario who can flutter like paper on a breeze. The application of this ability is pretty underused throughout the entire game, being replaced entirely by several other better mechanics that I won't explain right now because I go into much more detail about them later. Funnily, one of the stages is Asmongold's bedroom. It's a landfill! I'm just playing, there aren't any dead rats here, so this stage is actually a lot cleaner. The gimmick for this one is pretty weak. The stage is made of a bunch of weak blocks that you can break through. Things get spicy on the third stage because we're in a fridge now. I don't know how that made sense. 
why did I write that? But anyway, see what I mean by a lack of consistent theme? Factory, landfill, and now a fridge. But since we're out of that dump, we can enjoy some delightful rage-inducing conveyor belt platforming and another rolling puzzle. We do this by becoming Snowball Wario, and we automatically start rolling when we hit an incline. It's nothing crazy, the rolling puzzles where you just use normal Wario are much more interesting because you can jump, so Snowball Wario feels like a step in the wrong direction. The last stage is Pinball Zone, and it Who's that wonderful girl? really feels like this was a holdover from Topaz Passage. I feel like this counts as that toy theme, so most of this stage involves Wario throwing balls into catchers. When all of them are home, the blocker opens and we can go to the next part of the stage. I like this mechanic because it's more of a puzzle than the ability stuff, to me at least. I make it sound like I like puzzle games, I really don't. I just think Wario's stage design and puzzles are exceptional. You have to have a pretty decent understanding of how Wario's throw works and the time it takes for objects to travel when thrown. The worst part is how much waiting you have to do, and if you dare drop that ball, then prepare for even more waiting. It's made worse by the fact that Wario doesn't throw directly upwards, it's at a slight forward angle, so you'll line it up. It's realistic, but realistic isn't always better. But you think you got it, you throw it, and then you whiff it. But remember, it can always get worse. And it does. Once you hit the frog, the Tesla coil shoots off balls of lightning that travel along the ground. And now you have to finish more pinball puzzles within a time limit. Neat gimmick, but you'd never catch me playing this one again for fun. The next boss is Cuckoo Condor, and I think I vaguely remember this one, and I remembered the mouse too. I probably got further into this than I thought, but you know the deal by now. We farm up metals, then buy stuff to beat the boss. To save me some time, I thought I'd use a cheat code. So I have 999 medals. Some of you might have an issue with that, but I'm not using cheats to beat the stages. I still beat the stages with my own ability. I beat the bosses with my own ability too. All I'm doing is saving myself time from farming. If you've ever used fast forward, rewind, or save states, it's the same thing, so come on. Just, come on. This way I can also show you more of the shop animations. The first phase is pretty easy. You dodge the Tesla coil, which shoots a lightning ball on the ground that goes across the bottom of the screen. This is the first boss mechanic that actually gets shown in one of the stages prior to the fight. I wish more boss fights did this. I feel like stages should be used to teach you these mechanics, then the boss should be the final challenging execution of them. Anyway, our main target is the claw. When you pass under it, it'll drop. Then you turn around and dash into it. Then it'll spin around and hit the bird up top. Once it's in its second phase, it starts dropping eggs. If you grab it, you can jump, then throw them upwards to hit the target. If you don't grab them, then they'll keep dropping eggs that hatch into rubber ducks that explode. The best strat is to buy the fist item in the shop that for some reason does extra damage. Then you only need to do one claw and one egg throw, which I recommend only having to do one because they can spawn eggs pretty damn quick. It feels annoyingly precise. I don't remember this boss well, but I assume I kept brute forcing it until I did it. I didn't have the internet, so there's no chance that I googled it. Sapphire Passage. This is the last full four stage passage. We still have one more passage after this, but I saved this passage for last because of the spooky theme and I remember it the least. When we first finished the entry passage, I said that most people go counterclockwise, beating Emerald, Ruby, Topaz, then Sapphire, but some do counterclockwise too. So I wonder what the intended path for this really is, as we do have all of them available from the beginning, but as we've explored them, it's very clear that some of these are definitely not intended to be explored first. Both Topaz and Ruby have abilities we see first in Emerald, and Sapphire only has one mechanic we haven't used yet. Bat Wario. If counterclockwise is really intended, then this should be the hardest passage. The only way to find out though is to just do it, I guess. In the first stage, we get to have a flashback to one of the most annoying stages, the flying bastard that follows you stage. He's the soul of a dead pirate captain, and I was pretty confused at first because whenever he swooped down at me, he didn't deal any damage. Turns out, he's just like my partners because he's only interested in me for my money. Kidding, I live on ad revenue. I find more money in my couch cushions. They're definitely not dating me for the money. He mostly isn't a problem until we grab Keezer. Once we do get Keezer, he'll hunt you down, take Keezer from you, and he will run away until you chase him down and get Keezer back. In some of these areas that the pirate ghost is in, it can be pretty hard to get Keezer back. So you have to move fast and time jumps to avoid the ghosts. Also, yeah, the key is named Keezer because he's a big time snoozer. It probably isn't like a pun on geezer and key. He doesn't look old. I don't know. I don't know how old, I don't know what an old key looks like. It's here that we get the final form, Bat Wario. We mash A to fly like Flappy Bird and we use it to reach new high up areas. The challenge with this one is we have to avoid the lights because they turn us back to normal. The next stage is themed after 1001 Nights, but you probably know it better as Arabian Nights or 
Aladdin. It's a real shame that that mythology channel never worked out. This would have been a cool thing to talk about. Anyway, it's time for me to complain because this is the mechanic that makes Pancake Wario pointless and Bat Wario makes this mechanic pointless. The mechanic for this one is flying carpets. We hop on one, and when we jump, the carpet rises to meet us, then we gently float down. It's a weird mechanic to do, especially since they let us fly with bats. Maybe they could have elaborated on that mechanic with more challenging content. Honestly, I'm starting to get annoyed by this. On one hand, the new mechanic every stage is cool and fun, but on the other hand, the mechanics get so little time in the spotlight, we never get to see what they're actually fully capable of. They do have me do bat stuff later in the stage, but these mechanics are so similar that I feel like they could have ditched the entire Arabian Nights theme and went with Dracula's Castle theme instead. Maybe make some hallways of spikes that we have to carefully flap through, or have something chase us like the Ghost Pirate, and that pressures us to make us go faster. Instead, it's a new mechanic. Shows us a new mechanic, then it's dropped for something else almost immediately, then we probably return to it with a mild challenge later, then we'll never see it again, and if we do see it again later, it won't be difficult. The only real challenge in this game is the boss fights and the clocks. You might think, oh, why don't you raise the difficulty then? Well, raising the difficulty only affects timers and starting health. It doesn't change the stages themselves. All I'm saying is, if Wario Land 4 got the Mario Maker treatment, we'd see some really cool ass stages. We're on to Fiery Caverns next. A lava themed world, and with it comes my next issue with the game. You can't always tell which enemies are going to give you a useful form for Wario. You see this giant boulder and you think, gee whiz, I should move. I see this boulder and think, does this turn me into Flat Wario? We are not the same. It hasn't been a big gripe for me, but every time I see a seemingly pathetic or useless enemy, I bump into it to see if it's a new form for me that I'm potentially missing out on. It's only one heart, but I feel there could be a better way to communicate that it gives you a form. Maybe like give a highlight around the sprite of the enemy or something? Like it doesn't have to be like rainbow pattern or anything like that, it could just be like a slight red line or something. And Kirby, you don't have to worry about this. There wasn't a penalty for blindly gorging yourself on mystery meals like you're at the Golden Corral. But in this, I'm gambling. If it's not an ability, I lose a heart. The stage is full of slowly rising and lowering lava, which slows down the pacing of the stage a lot. But once you get to the frog, everything freezes over. Even those boulder guys turn into yetis, and we get snowfall and icicles. To me, it feels like they didn't know what to do with the rest of this fire theme stage. So they froze it over so they could reuse the mechanics from the fridge level. Not a big deal, but why include it at all if that's the case? Weirdly, they replace the snowball blocks with ice blocks, which creates a weird situation. My adult brain can go, oh, I have to snowball to get through the ice. But what if this was the first passage a player took? then they haven't played the fridge level yet, where that snowball tutorial is. Something like this happens with the Emerald Passage boss fight, Cractus. He turns us into a zombie way before we ever learn how it works, and now in the high intensity situation of a boss fight. They could have used anything there if it was about slowing us down. They could have used bees, and maybe we get hit by Cractus as we float up. Or maybe Cractus drops apples. It's a weird choice to not have us play in a linear fashion. The final stage is a haunted hotel, and finally, it's some intentionally spooky stuff. It only took the entire game to see it. I guess it wouldn't have been the entire game if I chose this place first, but you know, whatever. So, what does the dev team that accidentally scarred me for life have in store when they're doing it on purpose? Well, the vibes of this hotel are spooky. It's derelict. There's bats and ghosts and axe-wielding murderers. Here's Johnny! But we've seen all that already. Also, the music isn't spooky, it's kinda just chill. Speaking of axe murderers, I absolutely f***ing hate these guys. They can't be attacked from the side that their axe is on, you have to attack from above or behind. But the really annoying thing is they charge at you on sight. It makes it very difficult to get through the stage. I just want to go fast, damn it! Not much to say about this stage besides that it's a big maze and there aren't any new mechanics introduced. But that, boss fight time. This one is Cat Bat, and they are absolutely f terrifying. Honestly, if I saw that damn thing in my living room, I'd stomp on it until it was a small brown stain. Since they're a cat and a bat, I'm guessing that their weakness is the black dog item. Oh yeah, that did it. I'm so smart. The first phase is exactly what you'd expect to do. Hop on the wave and dash jump at the bat on their head. This can be a little difficult since the waves move very fast, and if the wave isn't high enough, you'll bump into the cat who takes up half the very small screen. Second phase, we use the waves to jump on their bald head. They're one of the easier bosses, so it's good that Sapphire Passage is so close to Emerald Passage. And with that, the pyramid is available to us, and the last stage and boss fight. Golden Passage. 
Once I beat Golden Passage, I will have successfully defeated the game, conquered my nightmares, and then I'll never play this game again because it's still, it's still a little freaky to be honest. Nothing is more terrifying than balding. We're so close now, I can smell the gold. Probably because it's all over the walls here. The theme for this last passage is, of course, gold and treasure, so that makes sense. But it's also still pretty aggravating themed. The final stage starts with us immediately landing on the frog. We have 10 minutes to collect the pieces, keyser, and find the exit. The first screen is a real pain though. You need to run across the platforms avoiding the chandeliers and pitfalls and get to the other side. If you're hit by the fire, you turn into Fire Wario and you don't stop running even if you bump into an object. You just turn around and run back. The fire on these chandeliers lasts a long time too, meaning if you get hit and you still finish the screen, you just keep running forcing you to use the waterway at the bottom of the stage and start the screen again. It's a massive pain. If you make it through this section, there's a yeti waiting for you and they'll blast you with ice. We haven't talked about this one much since Ice Wario is useless, but Ice Wario slides in one direction until hitting an object. So getting hit by the yeti means we have to do it all again. This final stage is designed like a rage platformer like getting over it. Thankfully, you can easily return to the entrance at the bottom of the waterway. So you can take this slowly if you want, getting a piece or two and then getting out if you're that worried about the timer. But I think the normal timer is already pretty generous. The hardest part of this stage is just the beginning part. Final boss time, Golden Diva. In the item shop, each of the bottom items are themed in a way to do the most damage to a specific boss, but there are only four of them. This is the fifth boss, so I'll just go with the only one I haven't chosen yet. I picked the large lips, and they don't do much damage. Unless I miss something, we're going to have to put in some work. After the large lips attack, they disappear, revealing the black cat. The shopkeeper was the black cat the whole time! Aren't you surprised? Clap for her, damn it! Anyway, black cat uses tackle, it's not very effective, and Diva kidnaps her feline friend. Get away from her, you bitch! Something weird about the boss, she dresses up in garb typical of a European king, but this is a pyramid. There's a big lack of Egyptian themes in this pyramid. Not to mention the music and the beam of light at the beginning, like she was descending from a UFO. Just what the hell is this pyramid? An answer we'll never get. Back to the boss. We can only damage her by hitting her ghost faces and throwing them back at her fan. After all the faces have been thrown, you can hit her real face. After this, her faces get really weird and random. During the second phase, she puts out enemies for you to hit and throw back at her. These can be flying monsters, big balls, exploding eggs, and a hammer. She continues this pattern until you get into her final phase. The hammer one is the only one that really mixes it up because you have to throw it at yourself. You aim up, throw, run under it, and you turn into Spring Wario. Then you jump at her head. At no point in the game before this do they give you a hammer to use on yourself. So I don't know how you're supposed to figure this one out. As time goes on, the pattern speeds up, giving you less time to hit. I'm starting to see why Nintendo doesn't make more of these, they're pretty damn difficult. And it doesn't exactly fit with their other games that you can sleepwalk through. We can't get Nintendo to make more games for adults, and we can't get Sony to make more child-friendly games. Damn, it almost makes you miss Sega. During the final phase, she goes super sicko mode, and now she follows you around the stage trying to smash you. You move out of the way, turn and dash, jump at her, and the window for this is very small. Also, if you're not careful, you'll make the field unplayable because with each smash, she destroys the ground beneath her revealing spikes. The most annoying part of this was that when she lands, you're immobilized for a moment. Same if you jump out of the way. And you can easily miss the very small window that you're able to attack because of this. This fight is horrible. It's very bad, and it's absurd the level of precision they expected from adults, let alone children. But we win. We get the loot. We got out. And as we look over the horizon, the cat transforms, revealing her true form. She was a pretty princess all along. The one that the pyramid was built for, I'm guessing. She gives Wario the biggest smackaroonie on the cheek before she ascends back to heaven. So, if heaven exists in the Mario universe, then hell does too, probably, right? Meaning that Bowser will likely be going there. It's okay, Daddy. I'll be meeting you there soon. That's the end of the game, though. We get a big credits roll while Wario drives off with the beautiful, warm, setting sun. As the sun sets on our adventure, we get beautiful sprite art showing our adventures. A really beautiful ending, but we have one more thing. Wario barrels down the road once again, nearly killing a white cat. Wario's on the hunt again, this time for a different treasure. The game closes out with a message from Wario, and we finally get the confirmation we've been waiting for. Wario can read and write. I... I definitely wasn't expecting that. In it, he says that we can attempt the boss fight again and try to get more treasures. We finished the game. Wow. I faced my fears and conquered them. Pretty early on, actually. I probably didn't need to beat the whole game. My thoughts on this game can probably be summed up by my opinions on the Sapphire Passage. 
While this is an amazing and well-made game, there are definitely some issues with it. The skill it expects you to display in boss fights is significantly higher than what they expect from you in regular stages. At times, it feels like I was trying to swim upstream, and the D.Va boss fight especially is a pain. During the stages, they're really fun and pleasant, but the boss fights are like playing a rage game. I think the reason why it was reviewed so highly was because it offered a challenge that Nintendo hadn't offered in a while at the time. At the same time, I feel like review outlets didn't play the full game because there's definitely some stuff to critique. It's very cool that each stage has something different from the last, but we never get a lot of time to practice with these mechanics. We're never challenged by these mechanics, as they're all very easy and the stages are so short. Each stage averages 10 minutes, and that's not a lot of time to put our skills to the test. I wish the difficulty settings applied to boss behaviors as well. It feels really lazy for hard mode to be shorter clocks and less starting health. On the other hand, if you get the right shop item, the bosses are a breeze. I don't do scores, and this isn't really a review. I just wanted to talk about the game. But uh, I definitely think you should check out the game, just for the vibes alone. And it's only about six hours long, shorter if you don't play the mini games and use a medals cheat. It's a fun experience that has the grace to end before it gets too boring or annoying. It's the perfect length. But Nintendo didn't have to can the series after this. Wario Land and Mario aren't similar enough that only one needs to exist. There's no harm in having Wario Land being available and Wario could be the key to a more adult audience. Look at him. He's a gross little Danny DeVito type. That's funny. Lean into that and make the games more challenging. I don't think WarioWare should be his only game. We can have both of these, and it's a shame that Nintendo has taken those away. But to be fair, Nintendo didn't really have the luxury of experimentation before the Switch. They were struggling pretty hard before that with the failed Wii U and GameCube. Maybe they don't want Wario to have too much limelight. A greedy, mean CEO who cares more about money than making fans happy might be a little too on the nose for them. Check out Wario Land 4 if you want, it's perfect for on-the-go gameplay, so if you have something like the RG35XX or original hardware, its bite-sized stage design is perfect for the smallest slivers of the day. Play on the toilet, play on the bus, play it on breaks. Personally, this made me want to check out more of the Wario games, like Wario World and Wario Land Shake It. I think Wario Land 4 definitely has the passionate indie dev team vibe, and it's impressive to see a big corporation like Nintendo put something this good out. Hopefully one day we can get back to a day when this industry was full of passionate people empowered by a company rather than milk dry to push slop. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all the suckers who give Wasera all her money. Wah! They also give me money so I don't have to go with a sponsor unless I think that they're actually good. Notice how rarely I get sponsors. Yeah, thank them and consider becoming one for as low as a dollar. Thanks again to Marius, Yini, Quilla Raven, Worm Syrup, Rideonte, Ras, Kaver, Wild Kitty69, Beef, Bait, Sly, Vaderson, Colorado Blue, Linky, Splackjack, and Malding Brick. I'll see you all later. I have to go sacrifice flesh to Nintendo to hope they put Wapeach in a game someday.